The 12th of March, 1947. America is at its peak. Daily life is carefree. The horrors of war seem far away. Today, though, President Harry Truman has a warning to give. The gravity of the situation which confronts the world today necessitates my appearance before a joint session of the Congress. The foreign policy and the national security of this country are involved. And the menace is communism. It's spreading like an epidemic. In the East, many countries are already in its grip. In the West, in both Italy and France, it has many converts. Greece and Turkey are still resisting it, but they could turn at any moment. The plague must be contained, and people must be saved from contamination. We must take immediate and resolute action. In the coming Cold War, any means will be valid to put a stop to it, even the most unlikely. On this same 12th of March, 1947, in Moscow, dialogue goes on between the two former allies as if nothing has happened. On the agenda of the assembled foreign ministers is the future of Germany. Ernest Bevin is there for Britain, Georges Bidot for France, Vyacheslav Molotov for the Soviet Union, and George Marshall for the United States. A hero of the Second World War and architect of the victory, he is now in charge of US diplomacy. The delegates put on a good show for the cameras. As usual, the press must see a spirit of collaboration. But in the chamber, the cracks are showing. Only yesterday, the Allies wanted to break Germany, destroy her completely. Her power is now a thing of the past. Since the end of the war, the vanquished Reich is on probation and occupied by the winning side. The ravaged country is drained, its population barely surviving. In the view of the United States, such misery is a breeding ground for communism, and times of penury such as this can only stoke its fires. It's time for Germany to get a fresh start. Russia and France don't agree at all. For them, Germany called down thunder on the old continent. She must pay the price to fix things and remain under strict control. Georges Bidot, the French delegate, stands firm on his convictions. Il y a un droit de préemption sur le charbon allemand pour les pays victimes de l'agression. Les moyens industriels essentiels, et en particulier l'acier, doivent être laissés en des mains sûres. George Marshall is annoyed, but it's no use. Neither the trips to the Bolshoi Ballet nor the endless official receptions can resolve the dispute. The conference ends in stalemate, and Germany's fate is postponed. I'm uh, very glad to be going home, and uh, I'm sorry that we have not made more of progress at this conference. As he leaves Moscow, the US Secretary of State seems preoccupied. Germany is not the only country in ruins. Two years after the fighting stopped, the whole of Europe is still on its knees. 
From the Atlantic to the Urals, thousands of buildings must be rebuilt. And hundreds of roads and bridges still await repair. All the penury and the restrictions are taking their toll. In England, as in Poland, in France, in Greece, or in Holland, people are exhausted. There's nothing. No houses, no food, no coal, sometimes even no water. Marshall knows it'll take time to get Europe back on her feet. And that this, even more than the Red Peril, is rapidly going to become a problem for the United States. America is vast, but its means of production have already far exceeded the country's own needs. Industry is running at full throttle, the surplus is growing, and without foreign markets, overproduction looms. Rebuilding the old continent is now indispensable to the economic health of the US. And it's getting urgent. When he gets back to Washington, Marshall calls in some advisors to come up with a plan of action. And he chooses them carefully. There's George Kennan, the leading proponent of the containment of communism, so favored by President Truman. Dean Acheson, a leading anti-Soviet and fervent free marketer. And finally, William Clayton, a former war surplus property administrator, now Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs. Their aim? To help Europe get out of the slump and guarantee the future of the United States. On the 5th of June, 1947, with America getting ready to celebrate the third anniversary of the Normandy landings, George Marshall is preparing a new offensive. Today, he's off to Harvard, the prestigious university that has awarded him an honorary doctorate. Among the guests there are professors and students, as well as celebrated figures such as Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, and the poet T.S. Eliot. In his speech, Marshall outlines his plan. Several million dollars of aid to rebuild Europe, including the countries of the East. Our policy is directed not against any country or doctrine, but against hunger, poverty, Desperation and chaos. It's a wake-up call there on campus, one that announces the end of a whole continent's suffering. It's only two months since Truman's aggressive speech about the need to block the road to communism. And now here's Marshall offering generous aid to all the nations in difficulty two sides, as it will turn out, of the same coin. For the moment, in this Europe on the skids, the American office got everyone's hopes up. In Spain, a film pokes fun at how sky-high those hopes are. But Franco's Spain is excluded from the Marshall Plan. Washington won't help a dictator who supported Nazi Germany. 
The Spanish are left disappointed, but both Great Britain and France eagerly accept. Sorely tested by the war, the two once flourishing nations are still struggling to get by. Enthused by the American offer, ministers Ernest Bevin and Georges Bidot get together to talk it over. Now they have to sound out their Soviet counterpart. They will be disappointed. Molotov arrives, not in the best of moods, to announce the Kremlin's position. It's categorical. Niet. American aid is a poisoned chalice. Any country that accepts it risks losing both economic independence and national sovereignty. And to underline Moscow's point, the Soviet delegate leaves the meeting in a half. Not a good start. Especially since, on the matter of sovereignty, France still has some surprises in store. The Americans lay out their conditions. If the French want to benefit from U.S. largesse, they have to free the 750,000 German prisoners of war they've been holding since the end of the war. And most of them have been allocated to rebuilding the ruined cities or to the collieries, which are sorely lacking manpower. But Paris is cornered and, like London, bends to U.S. demands. The first German prisoners of war start going home. On the other side of the Iron Curtain, Marshall's proposition has also awoken hopes of better days ahead. Several countries have shown interest, such as Czechoslovakia, where no sooner has he announced it than the Communist Prime Minister Clement Gottwald is summoned to Moscow. Two days later, on the tarmac at Moscow airport, he turns down the Americans' offer. Visibly uneasy, he declares, At the instigation of their big Soviet brother, all Moscow's vassal states will one by one turn down America's reconstruction plan. Marshall was hoping some of them might be tempted away from the communist influence, but it's not going to work. Europe is divided into two blocks, with only 16 countries candidates for the recovery plan. On the 12th of July, 1947, the future beneficiaries all gather to make the promise a reality. But they still have one obligation to fulfill, to create an organization to manage and distribute the funds. And from Iceland to Turkey, everyone's fighting his own corner. The French are haunted by the fear that Germany might rise again from the ashes while the Benelux countries, on the other hand, are anxious for their main supplier and client to get back on her feet. And the Swedes don't want any trouble with their neighbor to the east. As for the British, who have lost a quarter of all they had fighting the Nazis, they're clamoring for special status. It's all a long way from the united front the United States wanted far from the European alliance they'd hoped for.
Meanwhile, for millions of Europeans, things are just getting worse. Food reserves are running out. Bad weather has ravaged the harvest. And there's a shortage of wheat. In France, bread rations have dropped from 300 to 200 grams a day. Inflation is running at 80% and the black market's booming. In Milan, children are reduced to delinquency to meet the needs of their families. In Berlin, women are selling themselves to their occupiers for a few tins of corned beef or canned fruit. Sex for survival. For Marshall, the time has come to act. At meetings and conferences, he insists on the merits of his plan and on how urgent it is. The six and eight tenth billion proposed for the first 15 months is less than a single month's charge of the war. To be quite clear, this unprecedented endeavor of the new world to help the old is neither sure nor easy. It is a calculated risk. But there's no doubt whatever in my mind that if we decide to do this thing, we can do it successfully. But then there's Stalin. The boss of the Kremlin is not about to let Uncle Sam decide the fate of the world. In the autumn of 47, he lays his cards on the table. With Communist Party delegates from all over the world gathered in Poland, the Soviet representative Andrzej Zdanov announces, it's up to the Communist Party of every country to assume an historic role and lead resistance to the American plan to enslave Europe. The die is cast. Immediately, all the communists in Europe are up in arms. Wherever the party is well established, the demonstrations erupt. In Italy, the metal workers are in the front line, followed by the agricultural workers. In France, 80,000 miners lay down tools, soon joined by industry, state education, and the banks. In every sector of activity, people are striking against the threat of U.S. colonization. Thumbs down to the Marshall Plan. Some railway men even sabotage a railway line in protest, leaving 20 dead and 50 wounded. As Dean Acheson, one of Marshall's men, says, we could see the physical destruction, but the effect of vast economic disruption and political, social, and psychological destruction completely escaped us. And while a part of Europe rejects American aid and its supposed benefits, back in the US, the Marshall Plan has still not been voted in. It's taking time to get the approval of Congress. But then, something happens to speed things up. On the 25th of February, 1948, Edvard Bernays, the president of the Czechoslovakian Republic, is forced out of office in a communist coup. Czechoslovakia, communists inside the government seized power by the well-known technique of intimidation, and the country became a police state and Russian satellite under Premier Gotva. A 
America is gripped with fear, and the Marshall Plan is unanimously adopted. And now it has a new virtue, the defense of a certain form of civilization which is common to us all, as George Marshall puts it. A first tranche of $5 billion, the equivalent today of $52 billion, is quickly made available. The United States wants the OEEC, Europe's first organization for economic cooperation, to benefit. Soon, the first ships are arriving at Rotterdam, Le Havre, and Lisbon with the food supplies, farming equipment, tools, and industrial materials that have been so lacking. The rebuilding of Europe can begin at last. Commandé par la SNCF au titre du plan Marshall, 2500 wagons couverts de 20 tonnes parviennent en France en pièces détachées. Ils sont assemblés et montés au rythme de trois wagons toutes les deux heures, et cette cadence sera bientôt doublée. L'aide américaine permet à la France de reconstituer son parc ferroviaire, particulièrement pauvre en wagons de marchandises, si nécessaire à la prospérité économique d'un pays. Construction sites are everywhere. The battlefields are being cleaned up. The cities rebuilt. Industries are coming back, and the countryside's being modernized. The American aid is supporting all the recovery plans European governments have been setting up since the war ended. All those cranes are the heralds of a new era of hope. But now recovery is underway for the old continent. Those American friends are getting very picky about how their dollars are being used. To keep an eye on things, they've created a new outfit called the ECA, the Economic Cooperation Administration. So a whole colony of conscientious and zealous American administrators, officials, and agents now descends on Europe. With the task of facilitating communications with the United States, stimulating production in the countries receiving aid, and stabilizing their currencies. But that's not all. As one of them puts it, Part of our job is to push Europe to maintain a form of capitalism, a liberal system, and above all, a democratic one. Insidiously, a whole control system is being set up. Regular reports are required of the countries receiving aid. From France, they want a study of social security, the number of people hunting, and the levels of military pensions, as well as those of war widows. But also, a balance of payments forecast. For French civil servants, it's hard to swallow. One of them jokingly replies that, it might be easier, monsieur, if you simply took over running my office, or better still, the ministers. But wherever a state structure is found wanting, the men from the ECA take the reins and make all the decisions, right down to what products to import. And there are a few misunderstandings, mess-ups even, such as when Greece doesn't have enough working animals for its farms, so the Americans bring over some mules from Missouri. When they all arrive, the Greeks are a bit surprised by their size and by their somewhat temperamental nature. In short, they're not at all adapted to the country or its climate. Bit by bit, the generosity of the Marshall Plan is blurring into something rather less disinterested. 20% of the aid is in the form of loans to be paid back. 80% of it is in subsidies. The money's there almost exclusively for buying goods and materials made in the USA.
so, the dollars allocated to Europe are finding their way straight back to the United States, where they prop up the economy and mop up any surplus. William Clayton, Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and another Marshall Plan man, admits it. Let's be quite clear, our objective is based on the interests of the people of the United States, he says. We need big markets across the world in which we can buy and sell. America first. The countries being helped are also required to import half of all they buy under the American flag. This gives a clear advantage to the US merchant marine, and ship owners use it to impose prohibitive tariffs. We need the United States so that we can do without them, Georges Bideau publicly admits. It's a vicious circle. Once it gets to Europe, the merchandise is sold on the national market. So the revenue it generates is in local currency. Five percent of these revenues go to the ECA, officially to cover its administrative expenses. Behind this official term, though, hide categories that sound rather less administrative such as supply of strategic materials. France, Great Britain, Belgium and Portugal all have plenty of them, thanks to their colonies. Indeed, according to the ECA man in charge of overseas territories, it's in the French Empire that the most important mineral resources of any of the countries receiving aid are to be found. Manganese from Morocco, chromium from New Caledonia, mica from Madagascar, tin from Indochina. They all leave for the new world at knockdown prices. People are outraged, but for countries often on the edge of bankruptcy, there's no choice but to put up with it. Le plan est là. Or, c'est l'essentiel. Le reste, on s'entend pas de la rétine avec une patte de cloporte en farine. On leur dit, envoyez la camelote. Ils l'envoient. Signer le papier, on signe. Envoyez l'oseille. Et ce qu'il y a de plus formidable, c'est que les Américains eux-mêmes arrivent à s'y retrouver. Ouais. C'est formidable. Before long, in most homes, USA-style progress is what they're all longing for. Hot running water may still be the height of privilege, but everyone's dreaming of plastic and formica. There's one thing everybody's sure of. Tomorrow will be better than today. One housewife writes, the austerity was over, the new stuff was arriving. It was amazing how much time canned soup saved. We really wanted to be in modern times. The optimism won't last, though. Berlin is once again in the eye of a storm. On the 20th of April, 1948, 25 carefully selected German economists board a coach for an unknown destination. They arrive at a military camp near Kassel, where they're introduced to a man from the ECA. Cut off from the world, they get to work on the final details of a monetary reform forged in the United States. Operation Bird Dog is go.
In the strictest secrecy, banknotes are printed in the USA. They're brought over by plane in 23,000 crates and stored in the cellars of the Reichsbank to await distribution. The Deutschmark is born. On Friday the 18th of June, the Germans in the Eastern Zone read about it in the press. Two days later, the new currency is put into circulation. Schon lange vor dem Ausgabetermin des Kopfgeldes haben sich Schlangen an den Auszahlungsstellen gebildet. Keiner will zu spät dran sein. Jeder möchte bald das neue Geld in der Tasche haben. Überall Schlangen. Rekordschlangen. Seit Kriegsende war kein Ereignis in Deutschland so einschneidend wie die Währungsreform. Keines so bedeutsam für die zukünftige Entwicklung. That day, everyone is given 60 Deutschmarks in exchange for all the Reichsmarks they have, which have no more value and will be destroyed. For the second time in a generation, German savers are ruined. But Germany's chronic problem of inflation is solved, and the 500 billion in debts run up by the Nazi regime is miraculously wiped out. Stalin has had enough. He's not happy to see this Deutschmark arrive in Berlin right in the middle of his occupied zone. The city's still divided between the four Allied powers. is back to the wall. He plots his response. On the 24th of June, 1948, all road access to the German capital is cut off. The Berlin blockade has begun. Isolated, the city is in danger of famine and are falling into the hands of the Soviets. America reacts immediately. George Marshall speaks up. We should therefore carefully avoid approaching international problems on an emotional basis. We need to exercise calm judgment in determining the wise course for this country to pursue and then pursue it with determination and firmness. The Americans set up a gigantic airlift to help the population to hold out. Operation Vittles is launched. Operation Vittles will soon be on our way with coal and wheat and hay and everything's okay. Operation Vittles, as in the sky we go, we won't forget to blow a kiss to Uncle Joe. Operation Vittles is in the building way, and we'll need in hay, and everything's okay. Overnight, West Berlin becomes a symbol of freedom for the Western world. The Berliners are no longer seen as Nazis, but as victims. The power struggle between the two superpowers will go on for 11 months. 11 months during which over 2 million tons of freight have flown in right under the noses of the Soviets. In the end, Stalin loses the game. On the 12th of May, 1949, the blockade of Berlin is lifted. The Berliners will be okay. A few months later, the Federal Republic of Germany is proclaimed. And most unusually, the currency was created before the country.
the United States have succeeded in making Germany the center of Europe. Its finances have been cleaned up and it's on the road to recovery. Quite an achievement. Just two weeks later, on the 7th of October, and under the protective wing of Moscow, the German Democratic Republic comes into being. The Eastern Bloc and the Western are now truly divided. George Marshall counterattacks. We are engaged in a perilous struggle with an implacable foe. We must carry this battle to the finish. We must avoid the temptation to imperil the whole investment. And it is just that, an investment in saving all those precious articles of faith and ways of life we call democracy. It is an investment in preserving the freedoms of men in a clean and decent world. From now on, those benefiting from the Marshall Plan will have even more obligations. All trade with the countries of the Soviet bloc is now forbidden under pain of exclusion. One article of the ECA ruling even stipulates that no individual belonging to the Communist Party may participate in the distribution of the plan's food and supplies. But the Americans will go even further. As soon as the plan was adopted, a new bureau was set up in Washington, the Central Intelligence Agency, better known as the CIA. Under cover of the Marshall Plan administration, its agents have been sent to Europe. A top secret memo lays out their mission. A part of the funds destined for the ECA must be made available to the CIA with the aim of advancing the Marshall Plan by opposing communist elements in the beneficiary countries. The workers' unions are their first target. In France, the CGT splits in two giving birth to Force Ouvrière. The new union receives both financial and logistical support from the United States through Irving Brown, the head of the Free Trade Union Committee and a high-ranking member of the CIA. An ECA representative admits that they closed their eyes while giving them a hand. We told them to help themselves from the crates and we looked the other way. The battle's on in Italy too, where a general election's coming up. There too, the USA, via the CIA, is throwing all its weight behind blocking out any communist candidates and providing most of the funding for the Christian Democracy Party's campaign, even down to providing communication consultants. In New York, a campaign is targeting Italian-Americans, urging them to put pressure on their families back in Italy, and providing explicitly worded sample letters If the forces of democracy were to lose the Italian election, they say, the American government would send no more money to Italy, and neither would we. Unsurprisingly, De Gasperi, the US's candidate, wins hands down. Splendido risultato. 27 milioni di votanti su 29 di iscritti. La maggioranza assoluta è andata alla democrazia cristiana con circa 12 milioni 700 mila voti. Fighting communism is a good thing. 
but glorifying America is even better. The Marshall Plan has now become a wonderful public relations campaign for the USA. The countries they're aiding are obliged, at their own expense, to trumpet its many virtues. With exhibitions, films and posters everywhere singing its praises. A veritable propaganda machine is now at work throughout the continent. Everywhere, comic books target the kids with tales of individual courage in the service of liberty and the USA. With American superheroes who are all presented as saviors. The Russian foe is always portrayed as the devil. And the adults are catered for too. The Reader's Digest compares the hellish conditions behind the Iron Curtain with the sweet life on offer across the Atlantic. In every edition, articles celebrate the family as the essential basis of a democratic society. White families, of course. And God is omnipresent too. His apostles are everywhere. The weekly La Vie Catholique, for example, is keen to flag up its evangelism. The Mormons came over from America to redeem us. From America, too, came the Jehovah's Witnesses to go from door to door. Are they included in the Marshall Plan? And finally, to complete this blanket promotion, a new kind of animated film is appearing. Que la productivité, c'est un mot nouveau. Dans le pays A, pour fabriquer cinq bicyclettes, les cinq hommes ont dû peiner pendant huit heures. Dans le pays B, dont la productivité est plus grande, les cinq ouvriers ont produit cinq bicyclettes en quatre heures et avec un effort moindre. Alors, le reste du temps, ils devront se tourner les pouces. Non, car ils produiront davantage, ce qui normalement doit planter leur salaire. La productivité, c'est la capacité de production par rapport au temps passé et à l'effort fourni pour produire un objet. But the cartoons are just the start. Next comes the real work. Thousands of Europeans are invited to cross the Atlantic to attend training programs. It's a way of exporting to the old world the methods and ideas of the new. Great Britain alone organizes 267 productivity missions, so thousands of engineers, workers and managers can immerse themselves in the processes that have made America the world's leading economic power. While they're at it, they can discover the American way of life. Barbecues and tidy gardens. Tupperware and home appliances. However, in an instant, on the 3rd of September 1949, the sky over America darkens. An American B-29, on patrol over the North Pacific, has picked up a higher than normal level of radioactivity. The USSR has just successfully carried out its first nuclear test. The fear of a third world war grips the United States. The life of New York stops as the city's millions react to a mock attack by enemy raiders of this atomic age. From the stock exchange to air raid shelters, New York tests its civil defense. To judge by these pictures, New Yorkers certainly know their drill. Faced with this menace, it's battle orders for everyone. In early 1950, the Marshall Plan becomes a Marshall Plan.
Now American aid isn't simply a way to rebuild Europe, it's a way of rearming it. Marshall, now Secretary of Defense, affirms his position. Before the House Foreign Affairs Committee, General Marshall explains his support of military aid to Europe. The uh, only solution that I see is to establish a firm front. And the more resolute the front, the more effective it will be. And the uh, propaganda efforts to convey that this is an aggressive front, of course, are pure propaganda. It's time for the men in charge of American aid to be replaced. The ECA is gone. Now there's the Mutual Security Agency, or MSA. The lion's share of the funds is earmarked for the military. The German Federal Republic's punishment is at an end. It can now form an army. Fifty million dollars are invested in its rearmament. The French aren't happy. Some wounds take a while to heal. A demonstration in Paris reunites former combatants, deportees and resistance members in protest. But in the New World Order, France has little influence. Initially intended to last for four years, the Marshall Plan is interrupted after two years and eight months. Its founder heads off for a well-earned retirement. But although he has left the stage, many Europeans will keep striving to reproduce the American miracle they've heard so much about. Everywhere, they're incited to get into personal debt. Fridges, washing machines and cars, all bought on credit, are pushing Europe into the age of consumerism. There are a few mistakes along the way, but America's gamble has paid off. It's a done deal. On the 17th of December, 1953, with Europe rising from the ashes, George Marshall is awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. There's a bit of protest at the ceremony, but it's quickly silenced. For the moment, there's no question that the plan that bears the laureate's name has saved a continent from the devastation of war. It has revived its industries and its economic growth and restored their faith in the future to the countries it helped. It's true that those countries' recovery was faster than expected, but only by a year or two, according to the experts. In the end, the Marshall Plan gave things a boost. At best, it established a more positive cycle. But ever since, and to this day, the myth persists. And the so-called philosophy of the Marshall Plan continues to resonate. Generosity, reconciliation, hope. It remains the reference, the miracle solution to all problems. The truth is that, above all, it satisfied the US's ambitions for economic globalization and to legitimize the promotion of the American dream. Less a selfless act than a supremely intelligent political action. <laughs>